All right, welcome everybody. Uh, we have a wonderful speaker today, Mark Everett, whom Steve is going to introduce, and then we'll pass the time right over to Mark. So Steve, take it away. Thank you, Dan. It is indeed a great pleasure to introduce uh, um, Mark to uh, the ODPP seminar series. Um, Mark uh, started his geophysical life in Toronto, working with Nigel Edwards for his PhD, which he obtained in 1991. And, uh, he started life in Marine I If I remember rightly, he, he did 2D finite element modeling of a mid ocean ridge for controlled source EM for his PhD. And uh, he came here as a Green Scholar straight after that. He spent 91, 92 uh, as a Green Scholar here working with uh, Bob Parker and, and, and myself. Um, he went from there to Cambridge, um, where he spent a couple of years postdocing uh, in the Institute of uh, Geophysics there. And then he went to take up his current position at Texas uh, A&M College Station, where he holds the Howard Caron Professorship. And uh, since 2017, he's also been editor-in-chief of the Journal of Applied Geophysics. And uh, it's nice to host Mark because during 9-11 at the SEG, um, I was suddenly stranded in Texas and uh, Mark had a rental car and he kindly uh, drove me back to his place and I uh, camped out there until the flight started flying again. So I, uh, he was my lifeline during 9-11. I was actually sitting on a plane on the tarmac when that all happened. So it was nice to have some relief from that. So his, uh, Mark's going to talk to us today about geophysical investigations of uh, recent uh, archaeology. Okay, thanks so much, Steve. Uh, and you're the owl. Um, it's great to be here, and uh, uh, thank you so much for the invitation. Um, let's see, I've got to do this. Okay, so today I'm going to uh, focus mostly on applied geophysics. I'm going to talk a little bit about applied geophysics in general, keep it simple, and then talk a couple of case histories as you see here. Okay, great. So everyone knows here a geophysicist, I'll just put a simple definition. It's a scientist who makes inferences about Earth's uh, structure, past and present and future. Um, geological processes based largely on reception of information, of indirect information about inaccessible places. Um, so here we are in Malta. This is a time domain EM. This is a 10 meter loop, an induction coil. We're looking underground, we're looking at the Subterranean aquifers, not too deep, uh, tens of meters. You have Mediterranean Sea there, and it's a coastal, coastal aquifer problem. And everyone knows Earth is a complex system. So as an applied geophysicist working in the near surface, it's certainly extremely complex. Uh, this person here found that out when they tried to map uh, sandstone, uh, a fault in a sandstone. Um, but if you look at if you look at all different scales, you'll see different levels of heterogeneity. As, as, as you know, you look at the soil at the at the near at small scales, it's going to have a certain pattern of heterogeneity to it. Look at the outcrop scale, it's going to have a completely different uh, pattern of heterogeneity. Look at the regional scale again, it's going to be different. And you can zoom in and out of all those uh, different scales. And they're all, they're all going to look different, uh, different. So we have this sort of nested levels of heterogeneity that geophysicists have to deal with. So when I was a graduate student with Nigel, one of the things he told me is that um, when you, more data is good, you're going to reduce your uncertainty about the problem at hand if you have more data. But when you're working with complex systems, that necessarily isn't always the case. Consider, for example, the curious observations of the cave dwellers. These, these people lived in the cave their entire lives. They never saw the, the night sky. Um, one day, one of them went out and looked out there, and there was this big, beautiful yellow object in the sky. And they went back in and they told all their fellow cave dwellers, wow, it's something really cool out there. It's big, it's bright, and it's yellow. And, and the colleagues said, are you sure? And they said, yes, I'm absolutely sure. I'm 100% sure that that, uh, that that object is out there. So the next night, one of them went with them, and they both went out together. And lo and behold, it wasn't, it was there, but it wasn't big and bright and, uh, and yellow. It was rather hazy. And uh, the second person said, I thought you said you were 100% sure it was a big, bright object. He said, well, I'm not so sure anymore. I'm only, it, it, it's hazy now. So there's a 
uh, probability here. So they come back, go back in and they're talking about it and they're deciding whether or not if they go out again, would it be bright or would it be hazy? You have two data points, but they're only, they're done, their certainty about what they're looking at has gone down by half. And so they go out two weeks later and it's not even there. The, the object isn't even there anymore. In fact, it's on another part of the sky and it looks completely different. So they've got now three data points and they're very uncertain about what it is they're looking at. So the reason for that is that as, when you're dealing with a complex system, data can sometimes expose phenom phenomena about which we were hitherto blissfully ignorant. Okay, so uh, with that, I wanna focus more on the applied geophysics. So here's some commonly used methods that we use all the time. Uh, Texas A&M, the kind of standard, we've got electrical resistivity tomography, ground penetrating <laughs> radar, time domain EM, magnetics and seismic. I don't have time to go over any of these operating principles. There's many textbooks that do it. Here's one, for example, uh, you can look at, look at those. Okay, so what does an applied geophysicist actually do? You can think of it in analogy with medical or radiologists looking at X-ray images. What a radi radiologist does, provides expert consultation to referring physicians chooses the appropriate imaging technique, interprets the results of medical images, correlates medical image findings with other tests, uses those test results to design patient care, and then the diagnosis would be confirmed with an operation. Similarly, a geophysicist provides expert consultation to the referring stakeholders, chooses the appropriate imaging technique, interprets the results of geophysical images, here's GPR, Correlates the geophysical images with other findings, other tests, geotechnical, uh, other kinds of um, information, uses those test results to help design mitigation strategies for the problem at hand. Diagnoses can be confirmed in our case by excavation. But it's a very similar activity to a, a radiologist who in the medical field is applied geophysicist in their science. Images often require interpretation. They're not always obvious what the causative structure is. There's a, vis a visual example of some camels. You may have a, a difficult time recognizing those camels, but with the shadow, you know, you, you've learned how to recognize the object and, uh, and, and what is causing the, the distortion sometimes can be informative. Over here, the same thing is true with, say, magnetics. A uh, single steel drum can uh, create an image that isn't, a, isn't actually an image of a drum, but rather a dipole pattern, which is familiar to geophysicists, maybe not so much familiar to people who are interested in, in, uh, in having drum. They may think there's two drums or something like this, but we know that there's, um, we, there's a dipole pattern to a, a drum and that there's a, there's, a, there's a positive and negative lobe, and it, and it depends on the uh, geomagnetic inclination, things like that. But geophysicists have learned to interpret images and then convey that information to the stakeholders. So who are these uh, stakeholders that we are, are um, talking to as applied geophysicists? Um, in order to look, address that question, I looked at the Web of Science 2016 to 2019, 2000 odd papers, I looked at the topic ground penetrating radar. And I found that these were the, this was the groups that were using ground penetrating radar. Most of uh, the, the biggest number was roads, railways, bridges, like civil engineers. Archeology span was the second largest group. You come down here, get more kind of infrastructure, tunnels, pipelines, utilities, you have glaciers, ecosystems, military, landscape evolution, cultural heritage, agriculture, so forth. Notice that the, the geologists are, I, I, yes, I've divided them into little bits, um, hydrology, two or three cars, but they're not big users of um, ground penetrating radar, uh, uh, to my surprise. So really the, 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 the biggest users are the civil engineers and the archeologists. And uh, you know, there's some other, other, other groups of users here. Agriculture is becoming more common. Uh, I think since 2019. Um, so when you're dealing with um, 
with these kind of stakeholders, and you're a, you're a geophysicist and you're dealing with other communities, um, one of the things that you need to um, think about when you're uh, doing doing your work is risk communication. And you know, after thinking about it for some time, I I, I find that I, the ideal situation is where the uh, stakeholder and the geophysicist come into agreement on a risk estimate. So for example, I showed an example here of radar data from Westminster Abbey. It's showing some, some graves that we're interpreting and we want the stakeholders who are interested in what's beneath West, Westminster Abbey to kind of uh, assess with us what, you know, what are the causative structures that are, are making these uh, signals. Look at, it, look at it another way. If I look at the GPR image and I say to myself, um, and I make a determination, this is 80% chance this is a landmine here. Um, I would like the stakeholder to also have that same uh, belief that there's 80% chance of a landmine. Um, but with, with my, um, my risk estimate is gonna be based somewhat on my knowledge of electromagnetic wave propagation through the earth. And I, and, and I don't necessarily, and I won't be able to teach the stakeholder that same knowledge. So I have to find a way in which to, to um, for the stakeholder to come to the 80% likelihood of a landmine. That's the challenge, that's my challenge. And look at it another way. Um, for example, a television viewer can come to understand what 80% chance of rain means if they listen to the, the weatherman enough, they begin to understand what 80% chance of rain means without the weatherman actually teaching them the fundamentals of atmospheric dynamics. So, so that's, that's the task with risk communication is to have the stakeholder arrive at the same um, risk estimate that you, that you did. That's very interesting because it requires the stakeholder to have experienced enough estimates, you know, the, the rain example. The, you know, yeah, and yeah, so the, with the stakeholder, sometimes you may not have enough opportunities for them to see what your assessment is. Th but that's true. And, and, mm -hmm. uh, and, that, and that's going to make the job more challenging. But usually when I'm working with like geotechnical engineers like TechStot or, or um, environmental uh, consultants, they, they, do have enough, uh, okay. they do have enough knowledge that they, they can, you can get them over the kind of- so the, the calibration can be done. It can be done, but, uh, but it's a good point. Um, so, what are, so we've learned a lot of lessons in applied geophysics in the last 10, 20 years. Um, from the UXO landmine experience, for example, we can divide the, um, the task really into three, into three parts. Um, first is, uh, this, this would apply to other, other targets as well. First is detection. Um, what we'd like to do here is uh, think about what geophysical technique would uh, be best suited. This is an array of towed magnetometers. Are we, are, is that system able to detect the target of interest in its, at its burial depth, at the depth that's buried, and in its host environment. So these are key as well. Um, and once, once, if you've ascertained that, yes, we can do that, the next thing is, can we then uh, discern a target of interest from perhaps unrelated signals? So this might be, for example, a target of interest, and these might be uh, some range uh, uh, scrap or something like that. And so can we, can we make that discrimination of which of these are potentially uh, hazardous items. And then if we can do that discrimination phase, then we can move into the classification phase. So given the target of interest now, um, how much information can we get from the target signature? Can we get increment uh, the depth, the dip, uh, the size, the aspect ratio, the, the composition, things like that. So this is sort of what we've learned from how to do this from, from the military point of view. Okay, so now I want to, uh, before I go into those D-Day uh, analysis, I want to just uh, show you a couple of uh, case histories, kind of show you a little bit about what we're doing. Uh, this is a historic cemetery in Bryan, Texas. It's a very interesting, lots of very, very passionate stakeholders here. And, the, and the, this was part of my class, my field methods class. We went and made some uh, ground penetrating radar uh, data. We were looking for unmarked graves. This is 19th century stuff. And um, we had a line of known graves right here. 
uh, from the 20th century that the students went along a line. And you can see the signatures. There's one. There's one. This is a metal artifact. This sort of reverberating signal is indicating some kind of a near surface metal artifact. Uh, this signature here. Uh, this, this was an infant, so we almost missed it. And this is a double burial. You can see a sort of a double hyperbolic signature here. Um, one's usually stacked on top of another. Um, there, may, there may be something in here, this unmarked, something over there, unmarked. At the same site, we had the students. We found these two interesting uh, tombstones or headstones. One of the inscriptions was facing east as normal. One was facing west towards a trail. So I had the students do two lines. This is 48, 1970. So line one, they did a line one. And they were trying to see which side they were buried on. This is a metal artifact, perhaps an unmarked grave here, and tree beard obstruction over here. And when they went on the second line, line two, they found two indications quite clear that those were the graves. So the, both the bodies were you know, buried, as you'd expect, to the east. One of the inscriptions was turned around the other way. There was a trail. You come into the cemetery this way. And you can read and, um, three persons who come in through the cemetery trail can read the inscription if it's facing them. So we were able to infer that more than likely the trail was built between 1948 and 1970. And when the 1970 um, uh, burial took place, they, they inscripted it so that uh, persons on the trail could read. <clears throat> so example from archaeology. This is in the hill country of Texas, a place called Hall's Cave, working with the archaeologists. They were interested in a paleontological, paleoecological, archaeological record. Um, and so they, in, in, the, in, the, in the Texas hill country, a lot of the sediments flow into the, into the caves and accumulate there. There's not much sediment outside. And what the archaeologist was interested in was where's the thickest location of the sediments leaving at the highest resolution archaeological record. So we did the ERT survey, as you can see up top. And we have, we saw a number of caves and caverns in the red. That's the resistive areas. And we know there's lots of karst there. And there's a bunch of void spaces. The green is more intact rock. And the, and the blue stuff is the fine scale sediments and low con, uh, high conductivity. And so we were able to point out to the archaeologist where the thickest part of the sediment was so they could excavate, which they did. And they came up with a um, rather good record, which we published in the Quaternary Science Reviews. Um, from that, I can sort of have a maxim that and not always, but frequently, the main task of the applied geophysicist is to put an X on the map for somebody. So we were able to show them where the um, thickest pile of sediments. So another example we did for the class, uh, for an undergraduate class, we went out to Galveston Beach. Here's a ERT survey, a shipwreck, 1859 Invincible, a Texas Navy ship, sunk, sunk uh, a scuttle there, and is now covered with 15 uh, meters of beach sand. <clears throat> you see we did a number of ERT lines, found an interesting target, which lined up on it. It sort of seems to be a straight conductor. <coughs> we, 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 knew, we knew that there was a salvage operation to, to recover the invincible. We know that the ship lost the chain because they requisitioned a chain after the, uh, when they went back to Baltimore. And so we perhaps looking at the ship chain lying on the, on the, on the sea floor of the 1850s, which is now 50 meters below the sand. It's right on the on the line here between the um, the, the, the the sand and the underlying material. Mark, did you want to point out this one in the chalk trail? Oh yeah, that's like this. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and, and finally, the, I think the last one before I look at the case studies. This is work we did in Textile in El Paso. This is the border wall. This is the highway that was rather an uneven ride. There was kind of a lot of bumps on the road. So Textile wanted to explore why. They knew that there was a landfill that this 
Highway 275 was built over a former landfill. So we did an ERT line, quite a long one. We did 11 roll alongs of 56 electrodes. So we went for two or three days, just rolling a lot of ERT sounding. <clears throat> and we found some low resistivity uh, zones in the near surface, which correlated uh, quite precisely with some radar that was done, indicating this is where the land, landfill leachate was more than likely to be. Uh, this was an area that was a, a water treatment plant. And it gave sort of mixed signals there. But this is a caliche sort of environment. And so it was very hard ground. So we had to put in the electrodes with drills, with hammer drills. And we used the steel bits as the actual electrodes, which is interesting. Oh, I got one more. Here's study. These are um, steel piles. This is for geotechnical uh, exploration. Um, so this is a test site. These steel piles are in known depth. You can see this is the ERT. We knew there was a sand clay environment. We were interested to know whether we could image, how we could image those. You can see the signals of them at the top. Um, you can see a low resistivity zone at the base. But we still, we don't really know. We can't really tell precisely the exact depth or certainly not the cor corrosion state of the steel piles. So this is sort of um, this sort of challenge for geophysics that the that the um, <clears throat> for civil infrastructure mapping these sort of this sort of information is wanted, and geophysicists um, have uh, have you know are, are developing are currently developing methods to get the, that type of information in a better way for them. Okay, um, so the first uh, first of the case studies I'm going to look at today is at the World War II site at Point the Hawk. Um, here it is. This is the observation forward observation post. This is the U.S. Uh, memorial. These are the cliffs. There's a lot of uh, potential for cliffs here to be uh, eroding. They're unstable. So there's a preservation, historic preservation um, aspect to this. This is on top. See, there's a, a, a case, a gun, a gun emplacement. There's all sorts of rubble from the bombing. There's bomb craters present. Uh, it's a big tourist resort, uh, tourist destination right now. And um, so there's challenges from many aspects to this site as a cultural heritage site. Phase one of our project, we did some archeology. span <coughs> So we rented the time to name EM metal detector and we did a survey of this area here. These are our responses. This is shallow to deep. And this is a uh, high conductivity is in the, in, the, in this color. So we're seeing a metal, metal target here, which is in the form of more or less a circle. Um, we saw a circular trace on the ground. This is just one example that we've done. And we interpret this to be a, a railway turntable. We knew that the Germans used rail system to move their ordnance around from, from the bunker to the ammunition depot and back. And, they, and we knew they had a turntable. This is probably it. You can see its signature below graph. This, this is a very, uh, a large a metal object. We don't really see it in the ground. Uh, we, we figure like there's a whole bunch of reinforced concrete slabs, many of which are blown to pieces. And this is likely to be another one which is, which is buried. Uh, in the surface. <clears throat> so after doing that, phase two, uh, once they found out we could do things like this, uh, they, they, um, the American Battles Monument Commission asked us to investigate cliff stability. Um, because, like I say, the cliffs are retreating about half a meter per year. And so some of these buildings that are historic are at risk. Uh, this is, again, the observation post. The Germans used it to look out on the English Channel. This is Colonel Rudder's command post. Uh, Colonel Rudder was the head of the U.S. Ranger Force that, that scaled the cliffs in the first um, D-Day. And um, this is a former um, uh, anti-aircraft uh, um, uh, 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 station from the Germans that, that Colonel Rudder took over for his command post. But the, the cliffs are subject to a, a fair amount of uh, a potential for damage. There's soil wedge failures at the top caused by infiltrating groundwater. There's basal erosion, uh, uh, sculpting out these uh, wave cut notches or sea caves. And of course, there's wave refraction at the headland, which is, uh, we'll come back to that on the point <coughs> itself. So the general stratigraphy is uh, 
there's a layer of, of moss at the top, about eight meters thick, which is blown off of the English Channel um, during low, that's low level uh, sea, sea level. Uh, this is a familiar cliff, limestone, sandstone mixed. Uh, this is a harder rock. We have a marl, stiff gray marl here, which is like an impermeable layer. Water table is up here. So we have groundwater coming in from the from the uh, precipitation, which is tending to uh, knock, knock the top off the uh, cliff from the top. We have sea wave action on the bottom, tending to undercut it from below. So we have a lot of potential for instability here. Um, in other places on the English Channel, uh, we can see World War II monuments that are Saint, uh, you know, that are uh, disappearing into the sea. The hair point to hawk, person for scale. This is a rock fall. Um, people for scale, this is, these are gullies, coastal gullies caused by the groundwater. So wedge failures, shrink for scale. Uh, this is the uh, groundwater seepages after heavy rainfall. You can see some vegetation. You can see that there is a, there is a groundwater component to the uh, instability as well. So we use the electrical resistivity to investigate the, um, the risk to the buildings. A uh, multi-electrode system, here we have 56 electrodes. Um, we're measuring resistivity, injecting current and measuring potentials. There's a close-up of our deployment. Uh, there was extreme topography there, um, 30, 30 meter high cliffs. So we did, um, we wanted to get a 3D view, so we, we took advantage of the cliffs and the, and the triangular shape. So we get a 3D tomography, a true 3D tomography. So we, 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 we deployed uh, a lot of the um, electrodes on lines that extended over the cliff. And so we had students come out and, um, and, and on ropes. He's got his um, electrodes in a bucket, and you could, may not be able to see, but the cable is here. And so you go down, you put the, you put the electrodes in coming down and then hook the cable up going back up. And this person here reported also interestingly that there was a lot of uh, ordnance studded in the cliffs. There were, there were grenades and uh, mortar uh, from the, from the, you know, from the uh, 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 invasion days uh, still in the cliffs, which was quite interesting. <clears throat> So, so here's the sort of a layout that we did. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about the command post, but today we'll focus on the observation post. We have 37 resistivity lines. These are the bomb craters. These are the, the buildings. We had, a, we had sort of a control, control network for navigation. Um, some of them went over the cliffs, as it say. Uh, we have extreme topography, so we were using uh, uh, ropes and ladders to put our electrodes in. We also have what we call dense cultural noise. So we had a lot of metal, a lot of rebar, a lot of concrete. Um, and so those were all modeled into the, um, into the, uh, into the uh, equations. Hey Mark, how do you get really, really accurate locations for all of your um, lines? Awesome. <laughs> so, good question. Thanks. <laughs> so we had a we had a laser scanner, um, which we which we developed the three D DEM model, and then we had a total station. We we my dad told me how to do this. We created a, a polygon, a local polygon control network, so that if we have an electro here, we could triangulate three of our control networks. So to set up the polygon control, you just you know you traverse around it a couple of times to get the error depth. And if you want the location here, you, you just have to cite three of the targets and then bingo, you can get it to within like a centimeter or so. Wow. Yeah. So we were able to navigate that. And we also got the, um, we got the elevation from the DEM. So with those, um, we were able to construct, we used a, a software from um, Thomas Gunther at Hanover, uh, this BERT software, which does the 3D resistivity tomography. Uh, we had a forward, uh, finite element forward simulation, regularized smooth inversion. Um, you can see uh, the mesh is here, 83,000 nodes, and so many data points. Um, <clears throat> so these are the, these are the tomograms that resulted. Uh, this is a 3D volume. We're showing just the, uh, the terrain. Uh, we, we, we sliced and diced it. I'll show you that in a moment. This is looking from the Northwest. 
this is looking from the northeast. We had a sort of modestly uh, uncomplicated uh, interpretation scheme. Uh, blue areas were conduct we, we imagined to be conductive wet clay filled fractures. Uh, we had some core samples with the geotech, and we've, we did see wet and clay filled fractures. Um, and we, we categorized that as a, more of a higher risk. Um, the red stuff was more resistive, dry, open fractures, even void spaces. Um, we put this a moderate risk because of the, the potential for a rockfall. And you see up in the top, we have the soil edge areas. And then the intermediate uh, was a more intact rock mass. And we put that as a low risk. So we kind of made a risk map for the uh, site. Um, we combined the laser scan with the resistivity and we found areas uh, like that. Now, the interesting thing is that two weeks ago, actually 12 days ago, this happened. So this, this is the situation where we, when we did the survey, here's the wave cut notch. This is right on the point. And then um, we just had a news report that half of the point has collapsed. So this, this area really is in uh, deteriorating shape. So it makes the, it makes the work uh, rather important. Um, we, what I could mention here is that after we were done, we wrote a report and the French government um, put Shot Creek in the, and, and, and sort of remediated the basal, the basal uh, uh, holes in the cliff. And the observation post, they, they excavated around the observation post and put these micro piles in to the, to the hard rock. So that if the, if, the, if the cliff collapsed by a soil wedge failure, the observation post would be standing, would stay standing in midair on these piles. That way they were able to open it back up to the tourists. And, um, and if a failure occurred, the tourists wouldn't uh, fall down with the sediments into the English Channel, which is not good. <laughs> Um, we made a, what, what I call an interesting auxiliary discovery. Uh, that's we were slicing and dicing the tomograms. You notice this peculiar feature, which was extending from the forward observation post to this um, personnel bunker. We knew from other places and from common sense that it was more than likely um, a route for personnel to move from one building to another without exposing themselves to the uh, surveillance. And so if you look at if you look at each of those tomograms, you can see quite consistently the scale isn't too important here, but you can see a, 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 a very good conductor, which is more than likely more than likely to be a steel reinforced uh, tunnel by the right height. And then you can see it's cut into the bedrock here in places. Um, well, interestingly, uh, we also noticed a lot of debris and uh, heterogeneity in the bomb craters. And our previous metal detector work had shown that there was a lot still in the in those bomb craters in terms of metal objects. So this this um, we were told about this tunnel before we did the work, and um, that, there we go, <laughs> we found one. This is the team. We had the rock climbing expert. I have to give credit to Suiman. She was this was her PhD dissertation. Uh, she's now a, a, a professor in uh, Chiang Mai in Thailand. And it is two of the students that worked with us. Okay, so to finish, at the end here, I want to talk about Alcatraz for the last, uh, I guess, 20 minutes or so. Um, nearby here in uh, California, the, the, here's the Citadel in 1885. It was a Civil War era building, um, finished in 1854. And it was, it was designed to, to guard San Francisco Bay against attacks from the sea. Back then, there were a few threats. Um, uh, you, know, you know, there were the Mexicans, the British, the, the Russians, the Confederates even. And so there was a lot of uh, uh, thought that there was a need for a defensive structure on Alcatraz. Um, as time went by, uh, those threats, uh, the perception of those threats diminished. And so, and, and besides this brick building, was proved to be rather a poor defensive structure against modern, more modern artillery and cannons. And so effectively they, they removed the two stories, the upper stories of the building in um, 19, early 1900s, um, but they left the basement intact. And over top of that basement, 
they built the main prison building, which was initially a military penitentiary, later became a, a, a military prison, later became a federal penitentiary with Al Capone and, and so forth. Uh, but today you can see it, it's um, a cultural resource, obviously a tourist spot, but it's deteriorating quite rapidly in the corrosive sea environment. This is historic concrete and it's not very, uh, it's not, it's not, it's not very uh, resilient. Uh, this is the recreation yard. Um, we, we did previous uh, GPR on the recreation yard that I won't have time to uh, tell you about today, but we'll look at underneath the cell house. And um, you can actually go into the citadel um, through stairs here and through here and take a look at what's down there. I don't know if it's 100% open to the public, um, but so what we had here was an opportunity to do some interesting GPR. And, we, and this is the lighter of today's cell house. And these are the aisles, uh, places where we have access to. So what we thought would be a nice place to do GPR and where we have where we know quite a substantial amount of the ground truth in that building. Now there are areas you'll see where we don't have that ground truth, uh, but there's enough areas that we we felt that we could do a, a service to the cultural heritage uh, community by showing them what uh, what radar signatures look like uh, for given for given historic targets. And we kind of made a um, almost like a tutorial uh, study about this. We use 500 megahertz. Uh, we acquired the GPR over the accessible portions of the cell house here. These are the aisles. This is the barber shop. This is the library. And this, these are a couple of other areas that we were able to get to. And the citadel, the footprint of the citadel is shown in red. So you can see when we're going in the cell house, we go, we go over the, over the, this part is over the actual shower room. And then this part, there's some cisterns. I'll show you those right now. But after, after this, uh, this is the student, and um, we we had to conduct the uh, data acquisition at overnight time because the tourist uh, um, occupies during the day. So that was interesting. And working at Alcatraz at, at, at overnight, um, line spacing 0.5 meter acquisition lines were about 35 to 60. We, you know, it'd be nice to go into the individual cells and do some scanning, but there wasn't enough room to maneuver about. So we just created the accessible, readily accessible areas. Okay, so this is an engineering drawing of the uh, Citadel. Uh, when they, and it brings an important point. When you're studying cultural heritage uh, or monuments, there's the actual structure that was designed. And sometimes you have those design plans and sometimes you don't if the building's old. Then you have the as-built, you know, when you build the building, there's gonna be some um, uh, on the fly changes that you make, so you normally have an as-built. And then after that, it's the, you know, over, over time, then the building is get, can be refurbished, re, uh, you know, changes can occur, there can be re, um, deterioration from the environment. And in this case, we had uh, some seismic uh, reinforcements, some shoring um, that was upgraded in 2003. We had a sewer pipe, which was from the time of the prison rather than the time of the citadel. Um, so you have to, so when you're, when you're doing this kind of work and you're, you're interested in the citadel, you realize that you might not be looking at the pure historic fabric, but, but you're looking at what you, what you have there today. And so that's an important point to keep in mind uh, for that uh, reason. Uh, these are, this area here is, is what called the sister divisions. And so there was very little, no, there's no water on Alcatraz. They, they had to bring all the water in uh, by tanker and they stored it in some of these cistern areas, which are really impossible or almost uh, extremely restricted access. So we were not able to, to go in and look at these uh, cisterns. Uh, we do have a stand over top. Remember the prison cell house is over top. And, um, and so it's just a sort of linoleum or finished floor and this, their system somewhere underneath that we knew about, but we couldn't get to. Uh, one of the old persons at, uh, I say old, uh, uh, experienced persons at um, Alcatraz who've been there for many years, told us in the 1970s that someone actually went in there into the cisterns 
fly a hole in the roof. And that, no, you couldn't go in there today, but back then that you could. And here's a photograph that they took. And here's the hole in the roof and the system. So we knew that that was going on. Come back to that. Um, so I want to show you some scans that we did. Um, this is the first scan I'll show you. It's on Sunrise Alley, which not surprisingly is on the eastern side of the site, uh, along one of those aisles. These are time slices. These are the sections. And the time slices, you can see ceiling beams. They show up here as these hyperbola. You can see the, the, the base of the ceiling of the citadel and the floor. We also see some unusual structures here, which if you don't have the ground truth can be quite perplexing and you wonder what they are caused by. We were able to go down into the citadel and examine these in some detail so that we could then associate these signatures with a given target. And as, as we went down there, went down the stairs, we noticed that there were some unusually shaped columns in this uh, area we call the bastion at the base of the stairs. There's an enclosure where defenders could um, situate themselves behind this conveniently shaped uh, foundation. And then if they heard people coming down the stairs, they could look through the gun slits and shoot them. And so this is a defensive structure, so it makes a lot of sense. Um, but yeah, so, so we were able to identify uh, the signatures and the radars coming from these arched columns. Uh, we we're also quite interested to know whether we could whether we could see these vaulted ceilings in the citadel. So again, this is LIDAR data. Remember, we were doing our um, survey up there in the cell house floor. Turns out we could we got a moderately good image of A and B. We could see them. There's A. Here's B. Now these two here, we have a harder time finding them, but if you look above, there's kind of a reverberating signal. And so it might be some sort of steel or plate or steel pipe embedded in the floor, which is somewhat obscuring uh, A and B. I'm oh, sorry, the other two uh, vaulted ceilings. Moving down to Michigan Avenue, here's our time slice. Uh, here's our sections. Again, we see these are steel I beams. Or, or, or even the pillars from the shower room. This is the modern shower room that tourists can go, all tourists can go and have a look at. We can see these here in the ceiling. This is the water pipe. Um, this is the undisturbed rock. This is the Alcatraz terrain, they call it. Uh, the, the, the gray wacky that Alcatraz was formed from, from the geology. Um, this is cistern area, we'll come back to that. We, we went, some this red line here corresponds to here. So we went over the, the, what they call the dry moat, which is the walkway around and the central aisle. You see the signatures here. These buildings here are the kitchens from 1850s. We saw in the historical diagram. Now notice that we have some very interesting signatures here. And we were curious as to what those were. And so we went down and had a look and then we looked up at the ceiling. And lo and behold, there were some wooden planks in the ceiling that are held together with this shore. And this is again the time slice you can see now. You can now explain what you see in the radar with the target. Now, if you didn't have the ground truth, it would have been extremely difficult to imagine what was causing those kind of signatures. So it's kind of interesting. And it's sort of another sort of a, a theme is that I found over, over this study and many others that. Unusual geophysical signatures like this are almost always caused by unexpected subsurface structures like this. Um, very infrequently are they caused by measurement error or operator error or um, some you know, ambient sort of noise conditions or the equipment just basically breaking down. And, and oftentimes people will see unusual geophysical signatures, think something's wrong and throw that data away. Um, but I, I found that's where the interesting stuff is. And um, this, this kind of bears, bears it up. We looked at Broadway. We saw almost exactly the same thing as the previous one. Undisturbed rock, steel beams, this stuff. And so this was good because it showed us that, similar, that we expected similar structures and we found similar results. And so we have good repeatability that similar radar structures yield similar 
Similar structures yield similar radar signatures. And this is important for cultural heritage persons to realize that, hey, you know, if you see if you see a signature here, this site, it looks like this. You go over to a similar site, see the similar radar signature, you can make an extrapolation as to what, what it may be causing it. So this is another interesting area. We went to along Broadway. Um, we found this, this, this signature here. This is beneath the citadel. This is underneath the shower room. Um, we noticed the floor of the, of the two rooms were at unequal levels. And that was curious because we thought they were going to be level. So I spent quite a bit of time tracking down the architectural diagram for this, um, for this uh, for the Alcatraz. There's only two copies in the world. Uh, one is at uh, one is actually at Alcatraz, the other is at Illinois. So I got them to send it to me, and lo and behold, I did find uh, in an elevation perspective that the citadel is only 2.4 meters high, whereas the shower room is three meters, and this causes the difference. And if you do the calculation, it makes sense in terms of travel time. This is the floor of the citadel. This is the floor of the shower room with rock in between. You can see even on the architectural diagram that shows the rock. There it is in the middle. And so everything worked out really well. Notice that we see a lot of diffractions here. And these, these if, you, if you kind of um, look carefully, and you can see that a lot of these are caused by these footings, uh, these uh, uh, foundation footings. So they're informative. They're, they're very informative from the point of view of uh, subsurface structure. And oftentimes they're best left in when you're making the interpretation. Okay? Because if you were to do a migration or something like that and collapse all the energy to here, you might miss, you might miss it. You might say, OK, uh, you don't notice there's a brighter spot here. But if, with the diffraction, you can clearly see it, identify it in the footing. Um, the way I like to think of it is um, diffractions due to things like putting in their informative migration, they actually obscure them and may not do, it, do you any good. For example, if I was studying imagery and I was told to report somebody that an aircraft had come by through the sky, I'd probably have more accurate uh, success rate if there was a contrail present rather than just a simple aircraft, even though the contrail is really so, somewhat of a uh, artifact of the uh, propagation rather than the target of interest. And so these guys, Sometimes it's easier to interpret with when you have the diffractions left in. Yeah. Uh, this is another uh, interesting area um, here. We found this very unusual signature. Um, beneath the shower room, we found the usual ceiling beams. We also found a reflector A, which we went down in there and had a look, and there was a metal laundry table there that tourists could, you know, where they issued the towels and whatnot. And there it is showing up in the uh, in the radar. Um, this signature here was extremely interesting. It'd be hard to get that one with seismic, right? <laughs> and um, so these are metal doors, metal trap doors that closed. Uh, they were closed when we did our uh, GTR survey. There you go. And so we can see these really strong. These are look like multiples uh, reverberations of the trap doors uh, showing up very, very clearly. Um, so as we move down here to the library, you can see some more stuff. Um, we, see, we see the usual stuff in the Citadel. We see some more vaulted ceilings. There's more dungeons down here. Um, and we see this really strong reflector here, which is somewhere over here. And we, we recognize that uh, from, from, the, from the, the historic drawings. There's a large sewage pipe that extends there. When they built the prison, they had to have a way of getting rid of all the discharge. And at that time, it discharged directly into San Francisco Bay, which is not very pleasant, but nevertheless, um, that's, it, that's it right there. Um, now, the men's privy is sitting out here. Now, if you remember, the, the Citadel had two stories built over top of it, and it's a defensive structure. Uh, the privy, on the other hand, was sitting outside that area, didn't have any um, reinforcement, so it more than likely had a very thick roof to it. Uh, which is why we think we don't see any uh, signature of the, of, the, of the actual privy itself it, having trouble getting through the roof. <clears throat> and go down there, take a look. Here's some more sewer pipes. You can see the signature here of the sewer pipes causing these reverberations as you go up and down, up and down for the radar signature. 
Now, when we go to the cistern area, this was very interesting because uh, we did we did the scans along here, and from the time slices, we can see these little uh, features here in the, in the sections. They look like uh, they look like metal uh, um, uh, objects, just you know, they were reverberating all the way down. So that's an indication of metal near the surface. And they were in the, they were lined up nicely. I'm going to show you with the utility corridors where the experienced person told us that we used to access the cistern areas. So we think we're seeing those, those holes in the roof where you can access those cisterns. Um, and, and again, you, could, you, can't, you couldn't get in and check that, but they were sort of in the right place. Um, so I showed you the ceiling beams in the shower room. This, this is an interesting diagram because it, it shows you something about polarization. When you're, do, when you're doing the uh, scans, when, you're, when your antennas are aligned with the, with the pipe, so in this case, they'd be coming, coming down like this, um, you, can get, you can get a really nice uh, image of the pipe because you're polarized in the correct way. So your signal comes from your antenna, couples nicely into your elongated target, reflects back at the same direction, you get a strong signature. <laughs> but when you're going along the pipe, like this, you're scanning along the pipe with your, with your system, your, your, your electric field is coming down. It's not, it's not getting very good coupling to the pipe. It's gonna polarize, come back this way, but your, your receiver antenna is that way. So you, you get a very weak image of, of the same uh, structure. So when you put them together, you can see that the scans that go north-south show the ceiling beams quite well. The scans that are going uh, east-west this way have generally weaker structures. So it's an example of polarization and, and the orientation of the antennas is being important. So putting everything together, we see that um, we have the image here, ceiling beams, uh, wooden planks. This is the outline of the citadel, sewage pipe, um, cisterns. See how, I, I probably got this slightly wrong, but the cistern areas seem to coincide nicely with the utility corridors in between the cells. And those are little holes in the ceiling. So what does this all mean and why are we doing it? Um, again, we're trying to help cultural heritage persons to inspect their uh, uh, monuments. And so similar to seismic, where you have a seismic basics classification table, you know, we know what a salt dome looks like in seismic, we know what a stratigraphic track looks like, uh, things like that, uh, a laminated sand shale sequence. Um, they do the same thing in hydrology. This paper by Perez and Haney uh, looks at uh, faces, uh, radar faces in hydrogeology. So we thought it would be a good idea to build a, start building a, a classification table. Here's a target, here's what it looks like, these zigzags, vaulted ceilings, a hyperbola. Uh, these ceiling beams are more like this, and the pipe is more of a beam. So just as a guide for practitioners to study. So last couple of slides, I want to show you something we're just now working on, uh, curvelet analysis. It's an extension of wavelet analysis, and you, you may be familiar with it. Um, uh, what we do here is we take an image in this case, the radar image I've shown you before, and we calculate two-dimensional Fourier transform. Um, you, you, this is the 2D Fourier plane. You can, you can break it into scales with this sort of tessellation and orientations. And you can see, oh, you can mask out whatever um, coefficients you want. And so here, we're just look, let's say we want to, we want to eliminate the, the flat line stuff that's along this axis and just show stuff more or less weighted at 40 at this scale. And we have a scale as well. So at scale three, for example, we can we can see what the response is if we if we only consider these these Fourier coefficients and we do the inverse Fourier transform, you can see more clearly, you can get rid of the horizontal stuff and just see just see the vertical stuff, which is which is interesting because it shows that these arch columns have sort of an asymmetric structure. You can examine maybe you can get some more details from it. We found some other structures that were new. And so we, we figured this was um, quite useful. Just a second final example. Here we said, well, let's only consider 
this only consider this part of the Fourier at scale four. This is a finer scale. So we're interested, maybe we don't want to see the diffractions. We just want to see the flat line stuff. And so this is the decomposition we got with the curvelet transform. And you don't see too many diffractions. And I've also plotted in a seismic color map uh, to show that you, know, you, you, can, you can have uh, some, there's some interpretation advantages to, to plotting in uh, different, uh, different uh, color scales. Okay, so what are the takeaways from all this talk on business about applied geophysics? Um, this is sort of a summary. Receiving information can inc actually increase your uncertainty. Receiving new information can increase your uncertainty if you're dealing with a complex system. Earth's pattern of heterogeneity continuously changes as you zoom in and out. Um, primary users of near surface geophysics are these groups, civil engineers, agricultural people, archaeologists, perhaps the military, uh, more so than the uh, groups that you may have originally thought. Um, certainly it's true for ground penetrating radar. Um, ideally, when you're working with stakeholders, you'd like to come into agreement on a risk estimate. So you'd like, you'd like the person that you're working for or with to, to sort of agree with you that there's a certain risk associated with the uh, problem that you're trying to mitigate. Uh, three stages of site evaluation uh, that's been proved useful in uh, aspects of applied geophysics. So it's first is detection, second is discrimination, third is classification. Frequently, the main task of the applied geophysicist is simply to put an X on the map for someone. Someone will ask, come and ask you where, where something is. You go to a survey and you just point right there. And that's oftentimes what you're asked to do. Also, unusual geophysical signatures are almost always caused by unexpected subsurface structures. You know, you want to rule out the possibility of instrument error, operator error, environmental noise, and then chase these down because they're usually something quite, quite cool. And then, um, and finally, curvelet analysis, which we're working on currently, it, you're able to decompose radiograms in terms of scale, location, and the key point here. Is there like an extension of wavelets because they also can isolate uh, um, features by their own location. Um, so yeah, so that's all I have for today. Uh, thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to. After canonical time, but those who want to stay, I'm sure, would be uh, welcome to uh, step up after the question. Anybody online, uh, Dan? Uh, no one online has raised their hand yet, but if you're online and you'd like to ask a question, feel free to. Uh, George Jurassic would like to ask a question. Go ahead, George. Oh, hi, Mark. Good to see you. I haven't seen you for a long time. Nice to see you. Uh, uh, you, you mentioned hydrology, of course, uh, a bit. And um, curious, I'm curious if uh, any radar work that you're aware of is able to discern the, uh, the the interface between the fresh and saline water, and uh, I know there are a lot of variables, but are you aware of any work along those lines? Uh, yeah, with um, with the GPR, it's a little it's a little it's a little challenging because of the limited uh, depth penetration uh, that you would get. Um, we have had success with the saltwater intrusion problems using. Um, Mostly time domain EM, the GTEM uh, system, uh, we're, we're, which is what we would uh, we, we would generally uh, look into into that for saltwater intrusion problems. I'm not I'm drawing a blank on uh, radar uh, for for particularly for saltwater intrusion at coastal aquifers. Yeah, I wasn't thinking so much of intrusion as just the normal groundwater status where you have the fresh water above the saline water. The yeah, I, I would I would recommend the ERT uh, over. Okay. Uh, we've got very good very good success uh, looking at freshwater impoundments down at the Gulf of Mexico with the ERT. By the way, I always used uh, blue for resistive, and I don't know if it's changed since the ten years I've been messing around with this stuff, or uh, or it's just that uh, within radar, you maybe you're using uh, red for resistive. When you're when you're plotting things up, of course. Uh, yeah, well, in the near surface, blue means water, uh, and uh, 
and, and in the uh, in the deeper down, I guess blue means uh, you know melt or something like that. So we do. I mean, I remember many, many discussions about this <laughs> over, uh, you know, many decades, but thanks very much. Nice, nice to see and hear what you're doing. George. Ah, so uh, you mentioned reverberations many times. Like that reverberation between a metal artifact um, Barrier and the uh, prism. Yeah, so so you'd have like a, 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 a plate or a pipe or some metal target or, or something like that, and and the signal would bounce from the antenna, and so you get a series of reflections that would be sub horizontal, and then you'd have a hard time seeing you know, whatever's below that because a lot of the energy would just go into multiple bounds. But it's still possible to locate the precise facts on that. Reflector because all the reverberations are up, up after the, the first arrival. Uh, yes, you can still estimate the depth to the pipe by the travel time to the to see even to the first uh, bounce. You could, you could estimate the depth and you could probably confirm it with the multiples. Okay. Yeah. But that happens only with very bright reflectors. Like yeah. Metals. Yeah, metals are per all, we consider it a perfect reflector. Of course, it's not fancy, but we consider it a perfect reflector. Um, usually, when you see those kinds of things extending all the way down your section, it's uh, we usually say, okay, that's probably going to be. And then when you dig it up, you usually find something. Like in the cemeteries, um, we, 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 we don't dig things up in the cemeteries. That's what somebody else, nobody does that. Um, but sometimes when we get these big re reflections, you know, you, you know, you know, okay, there's a you know, garbage can or something. <laughs> So in the cemeteries, the signature comes from the disturbance of the ground. I can do. So there's. Uh, it depends on. It depends on the style of burial. Like uh, with these African American cemeteries, um, uh, these communities, uh, many people couldn't afford caskets or mm -hmm. whatnot. So they were buried just with cloth. And there, you're probably looking at the the pit, the disturbance of the soil. But when you have like a, 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 a more recent barrel with a casket, you see some really much more strong signals either from the wood or it could be metal lining on, on the wood or it could be an, an entirely steel steel casket. So it, it depends on the on the style of burial. We went to, and it depends a lot also on the host material. Like the Brian, the, 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 the conditions were extremely sandy. Fortunately, and people like to bury, uh, have cemeteries in sandy places, it's easier to dig. Uh, but in Brenham, nearby, where there was a very important historic cemetery, we couldn't see anything because it was very thick uh, alluvial clay. And, and we, spent, we spent days out there and couldn't find one unmarked grave. Or one, we couldn't even see the marked graves. But at, at Canaan Cemetery, uh, the students themselves found upward of a dozen. And at another cemetery, they they estimated there were 45 unmarked graves, and we found 50 or 55. So, and these were sandy. Uh, this was in the sandy sites. Okay, thanks. If there are no more questions, we'll thank Mark again. And let him get